54th episode of the Atlas Society Asks. I'm Jennifer Andrew Grossman. My friends know me as JAG. I'm the CEO of the Atlas Society. We are the leading nonprofit organization introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand uh, in creative ways like our graphic novels, our animated video, our social media. Um, today, we are joined by a friend of mine, Randy Wallace. I'm going to introduce him, but before I do that, I want to remind all of you that are joining us on Zoom, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, and YouTube, you can use the comment section uh, to type in your questions. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. Randy Wallace is the Oscar-nominated creative force uh, behind the epic storytelling of such critical and box office hits as Braveheart, We Were Soldiers, Pearl Harbor, The Man in the Iron Mask, and Secretariat. He is a screenwriter, a director, a producer, a novelist, an athlete, and a songwriter. He is the author of seven novels, including Pearl Harbor and The Touch, which I am re-listening to on Audible. Uh, his most recent book is Living the Brave Heart Life, Finding the Courage to Follow Your Heart, which is about his creative and personal journey. He also, I will add, uh, wrote the most magnificent screenplay that I have ever read. It's um, of Atlas Shrugged itself. And while it has yet to be produced, it's um, an, just an absolutely stunning achievement, uh, which dramatized Ayn Rand's masterpiece with, with concision and, and yet um, totality, uh, which demonstrates not just his, his craft, but an, a, uh, a really profound understanding of um, Ayn Rand's art and her philosophy. So I hope we'll get to a little bit of that as well. Randy, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. It's great to be with you, Jennifer. I'm excited. Uh, well, let's start with Braveheart. Okay, obviously that was early on in your career and, and most people continue to associate um, you with, with that work. In your book, uh, Living the Braveheart Life, you share a bit about what inspired your original curiosity about William Wallace uh, on a trip to Scotland. And yet it was many years until you felt ready to undertake that, that project. Uh, you describe how during a difficult pass, um, a writer's strike, concerns about providing for your family, you, you finally got the impetus to dive in. So if you would just share a little bit about that, that journey. So I started um, I, would, I would sort of mark my journey in um, wanting to be a writer when I was quite young and having parents who came out of the depression and had to struggle economically as everyone did. And they were quite gifted. Um, my father was a, a brilliant salesman, uh, charismatic, full of confidence and like my mother was academically brilliant and yet neither one of them could go to college. And so I, I carried the banner, my sister and I did for, for our family's hopes and their aspirations. And um, when I became a writer, I felt that I was in some ways betraying my parents' sacrifices. And uh, I struggled for a while, but did start to become successful and then reached a point at which the decision to, to go and create my own story, to tell my story instead of someone else's, became a crisis. I felt it was as if I, when I quit, I quit a job that I was making a lot of money in and suddenly had no money uh, because of this writer strike that went on and on. I, I had planned, but I hadn't planned for every eventuality. And I felt like someone who had been on a great cruise ship, like the Titanic, who decides, I think I'll just jump overboard. And I watched the ship sail away with the party going and the lights, and I was out alone in the freezing water, thinking, what have I done? But 
that was the Titanic. Uh, that career would have been the Titanic for me. And, and being in that cold water led me to Braveheart. The further I get down the road of my journey, Jennifer, I think that the, we appreciate art not only for the art itself, but the journey that the artist made to get there. It enriches our appreciation of the, of the piece. When I, I'm not a big art collector, but when, when I look at a great painting or hear a great piece, piece of music, I wanna know where the composer or the artist was in his or her life when they did that. And, and that was part of why I wanted to to write Living the Braveheart Life. And I know we're gonna get into Rand, but it was part of why I related so strongly to the story of Atlas Shrugged, to the, the idea that this is my commitment. I'm gonna go out there alone if I have to, to build that bridge, to dig that tunnel, to do whatever it is I've gotta do. And that commitment, a, a friend of mine reads classical literature all the time. And he says that the Greeks believed the gods favored the bold. And uh, there was a time in my life and that I saw that so clearly and I've never not seen it clearly since then. And also I think there was a, a curiosity about your family, about your roots. Um, you had your uh, first son on, on the way and uh, were traveling in Scotland and saw this statue and said, Ooh, Yeah, so the, the broad strokes of that, um, my, my wife uh, was, um, she, she had some hesitations about becoming a mother because she was such a successful dancer. And, and having children presented itself as the close of a career. And that's, I know, an extremely, difficult thing for a woman to face. And um, our deal was, if you get me pregnant, you've got to take me to Europe. And uh, I had only been once before in my life and I certainly agreed. And, and here she is pregnant and she knew her family ancestry and I knew none of mine. So I suggested a detour to Scotland where I'd heard there were Wallaces and it was there that we walked into Edinburgh Castle and saw a statue of a man named Wallace. And I asked a guard there who he was and he said, he's our greatest hero. And on the other side of the door, flanking the, the door on the other side was Robert the Bruce. And I asked the guard, well, they're, they're clearly contemporaries. And I knew Robert the Bruce was the greatest King of Scotland and had fought the English. So I, said, was Wallace an ally in, in the fighting for Robert the Bruce? And the guard said, no one will ever know for sure, which are the magic words for any writer. But our legends say Robert the Bruce may have been one of those who betrayed William Wallace to clear the way for him to become the king. And what that said to me was, could there have been some possibility that the way William Wallace lived and died was what transformed Robert the Bruce from a man who would betray his country's greatest hero to a man who could become their greatest king. I've been reading lately, um, prompted largely by Jordan Peterson's biblical uh, lectures. I started, re I read the whole Bible again and the, the stories of King David are staggering. So David's courage is amazing, but also his crimes were appalling. And yet he owned his crimes and he transformed. He was constantly becoming something greater. Um, those stories are ir irresistible to me and I think to everyone. So you talk about being interested in not just a piece of art, but understanding the artist, understanding where they were in their journey. And you are just giving us some background on, on your journey um, those decades ago when you embarked upon Braveheart. Uh, but of course your journey to be becoming who you are today, to becoming a, a 
a screenwriter uh, took me down a rather circuitous path. Uh, I, I do understand that you, like Ayn Rand, had been writing stories uh, from a very early age. You went on to study Russian and religion, um, clearly a, a fascination and an interest that continues to this day. Um, you put yourself through a graduate year of seminary uh, teaching martial arts, but I think perhaps one of the most um, charming aspects of, of your sort of early life was you managed a show of farm animals uh, that played musical instruments. And you said that was a, a uh, perfect preparation for working on a Hollywood set. So uh, I guess, you know, looking back, maybe some reflections on how those experiences shape you as the artist that you would later become. Yes. So the way that job came about was phenomenal for me. I was, I was doing a graduate year um, at Duke and I learned about auditions in Nashville for a theme park. And I had been planning to try to go there uh, prompted by Chris Christopherson, who's absolute genius who lived in Malibu up until fairly recently. I, I never ran into him in Malibu, but I'd run into him when I was in college and he had encouraged me to go to Nashville. And he was a Rhodes Scholar, a boxer, uh, airborne ranger, helicopter pilot, man's man. So he was a model for me of the, I thought if a guy that I admire so much has followed this path, maybe that's a path I should explore. And I was prepared to wash dishes or do whatever. In fact, though I grew up without a great deal of money, I feel I was one of the richest people in the world because my parents loved me, had a, have a brilliant sister. Um, I had good friends and I, all the struggles that any artist might have, but, but I, I had it good. And I thought it would be good for me to, to suffer some. Not, I didn't want to be self-inflicted, but I figured if I was going to do this career, I needed to pay for it myself and have skin in the game. And that would teach me something. So I went to Nashville and auditioned and got a job in this animal show. And I had trained barnyard animals who played musical instruments. I, I love to tell the story. It's true, absolutely true. I had a pig that played the piano and I named him Pigarachi. And uh, I had a duck that played the drum and named that duck Bert Backquack. And 8,000 people a day saw this show. And, and that, was, that was great experience for me in hard work. I, I worked maybe 80 hours a week then. And I would get up at 4.30 in the morning to write songs. And um, it did teach me I guess a certain resilience, Jennifer. Um, I think that's another probably of the, the Rand values is, it is resilience, perseverance, belief in yourself, belief in, in the vision. Um, and, and that is absolutely vital in directing movies because there are times when no one around you can see the vision that's inside your own head. And it's your job to manifest that vision and to communicate it. Sometimes you have to assemble it in front of them before they can see it. And that requires a lot of grit. And patience, I would, I would think as well. Um, and I definitely can relate to what you're saying about resilience uh, and also thinking about Ayn Rand and her ability to withstand a ton of, of criticism, attacks, being vilified, uh, being very controversial in her anti-communism, in her um, celebration of capitalism. And it's interesting because I think sometimes our, our greatest strengths can then also on the, on the shadow side turn into um, handicaps, you know, that she had to drown out all of, as she was 
crossing that, uh, that tightrope, you know, uh, accomplishing something so uh, dramatic, so risky, and had to drown out everybody telling her that she had it wrong. But then almost that, that ability to drown it out, to kind of tune, tune out what, what people are, are, are saying, criticism, can then, can then trip you up later on because you know, being able to, to hear from others, um, criticism, suggestions, you know, that's, that's also part of the, the journey. And, uh, you know, the values that we celebrate at, um, at the Atlas Society, productivity, achievement, uh, by any measure, what you have accomplished in, in your life thus far um, in tremendously complicated endeavors in, in fiercely competitive fields. I mean, you know, it's like you say on Passover, that would be enough, Diana, you know, like uh, writing one novel, that would be enough, but writing multiple novels, multiple screenplays, directing. So, um, you know, talent is, is not something that, that we're all born with. We, we can cultivate it, but, but are there other particular qualities, traits, characteristics that, uh, that you can partly credit for the success that you've achieved, anything uh, in particular that the young people that that we uh, teach at the Atlas Society that you have been generous enough to to teach at our um, Atlas Advocates Retreat? Uh, what what are those characteristics that young people would be well counseled to uh, to consider and and possibly emulate? Let me just say before I I directly answer that. The, the time I spent with those young people at that retreat was one of the highlights of decades for me. It was, a, it was an incredibly exciting and inspiring time. And I would urge people to, to explore that. Um, the, the questions that they asked, the, their, their attitude about life was uh, inspiring for me. And I, I think the direct answer to what you're asking is that I experience it as a paradox. There's, um, uh, there's a Scottish prayer, God grant that I may always be right for thou knowest I am hard to turn. And it's, it's just a, a pain to stubbornness and it's great to be stubborn. The, the, paradoxical side of that, which I, I think a quality of a paradox is that opposites are both true and they, they validate the truth of the statement that are the, are the approach. You have to be stubborn and you have to be stubborn enough to realize that you may need to change. I, I said once to um, a, a friend, a counselor actually that I was, I was struggling with a deep, wrenching life decision. And, and I said, I feel that if I, I go this one direction, I'll be a quitter and quitters never win. And she said, that's one way to look at it. But another way is if you don't stop doing what's not working and try something else, you'll never win. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a kind of a, certainly a, a mind opening realization. I felt that one of the qualities that Rand has, and I, I would love to know, cause you know far more about her than anyone else I've ever met, is when there's a, a, a personal emotional crisis of I've done something and I don't know if it's gonna resonate with other people. I mean, even with say Atlas Shrugged, it was, it, it's not just an instant success of people embracing and immediately going, oh, thank you, we've got this, I've got to give it to all my friends, I've got, everybody's, gonna, everybody's gonna like this. And, and it takes a certain kind of brokenness even or willingness to, to suffer uh, that to, to persevere to know that if you do this, if you commit that the, the amount of time that it would take to write Atlas Shrugged, the amount of energy, the amount of personal commitment in every way, and then to not know if people are gonna 
respond. In fact, to have the evidence that other people are gonna really come at you is not encouraging to some people. Now, there are other people that view this, and I think it's a part of an entrepreneurial spirit. If everybody thinks this is a bad idea, there must have be some merit in this idea. Otherwise they would just shrug and ignore me. But if they're attacking me, then I must be hitting something. And I, and I wonder how much of that was in her, the inner struggle of it all. Well, she, um, she certainly had the perseverance. I think she had the confidence she, she was later in her career at, you know, at, at this point, um, she had written Fountainhead, which had been rejected uh, 12 or, or I think 12 times before it was finally picked up. Um, but uh, but I, I think that overall, she probably didn't struggle with too many doubts about whether this was artistically correct, you know, whether or not she had um, integrated the theme if she, you know, she, she felt that she could account for, if you asked her, well, what about this comma, you know, on this page? I and mean, why did you have this character that, that she was, uh, she could account for, for all of them, which, which brings me to another question um, in terms of your connection with Atlas Shrugged. Um, and uh, I, I guess I wonder you know, you talk a little bit about those aspects of Rand's character, her perseverance, her stubbornness, if you will, um, her confidence, her workaholism. <laughs> um, but uh, what what was it about the the work itself, um, whether from a philosophical perspective or just as one you know one artist judging another? It's unique. I don't know anything else like it. It's bold and assertive. I, there, there, there's a lot of literature about strong women. I always love Jane Austen um, and Emily Bronte. And I love writers of that era. My favorite writer of all time is Jill Connor Brown, who's a, contemporary writer in, in Mississippi is, she's really a female Mark Twain. Uh, and they write bold and vivid women, but I don't know anyone who wrote like Rand did. And not just Dagny, but um, Reardon. It, the, the men that she wrote were, were profound and uh, I don't think I'll ever forget one scene in which Reardon has been working just maniacally and he goes in and sits down at the table with his family and, and he's getting criticism from everybody closest to him, his wife, his, his mother, his brother. It's, it's, that really struck me as I could relate to it. it although I've, I've had an incredible amount of support from people closest to me, but I've also had those people that I looked to for support who were not uh, providing what I hoped. And in the way her characters faced the world, that showed me a, um, a, a bold story and an original point of view, I would say a genius point of view in in her outlook. I think what, what we love about an artist is not just their hand, their skill, but it's their vision. Uh, their hand is executing, is showing their vision. And uh, she had a remarkable vision. And it really was a kind of a heroic vision. Um, it was very positive. It was uh, idealistic. Um, and in that way, I think it, it reminds me, even though it, it didn't have the tragic ending that, that Braveheart had, although I know you and I could probably debate about whether that was tragic or whether that, that was uh, a kind of transcendence, you know, at, at the end of, of Braveheart. But um, 
but it was a, a very positive view. I, I know at the time um, after Atlas Shrugged was, um, was published and then she moved on to more nonfiction and to developing her philosophy and Atlas Shrugged began, began to gain currency and followers and, and people would say, this is a prophecy, you know, this is happening uh, around us. And, and again, um, you know, now we are hearing, hearing that again, that uh, uh, Directive 10-289, you know, stop the economy, start the economy, that we're kind of seeing that hubris uh, again with some of the government um, central planning that we can just move around these incredibly complex e economies. Um, but, you know, at the time people said, is, did you intend this to be a prophecy? And she said, if prophecy is understood to mean um, a predestined, unavoidable doom, then no, that's actually the opposite of, of what I meant. I meant Atlas Shrugged to be a testament uh, of man's ability to recognize that we're going in the wrong way and man's ability to, to change course. So it, it was, it's very positive. And, you know, one of the things that uh, we focus on at the Atlas Society were philosophical think tank. And, you know, we, we focus not just on objectivism, um, but also on understanding the, um, the threats to uh, the enlightenment tradition of reason, of objectivity, of freedom. And, and one of the threats that, that we focused on, we wrote the, the Pocket Guide to Postmodernism, um, our postmodernism Draw My Life video. And, um, you know, the way that postmodernism has uh, repackaged the conflict in, inherent in um, Marxist theory to, to frame social relationships, but, but also we, we do this less so, and that's why I wanted to ask you about it. Uh, we, we do cover a bit about um, postmodernism in aesthetics and, and the way that it is, is the antithesis of Ayn Rand's view of the heroic uh, and that it instead kind of emphasizes pathology and, and darkness and, and even kind of banality or, or triviality, uh, and which is again, very much the opposite of the kinds of, I think very idealistic novels and, and screenplays that you have uh, written. So um, have you seen evidence of a kind of cultural shift in, in the art of screenwriting and, and film making, or uh, does, does the market just responding to a a stubborn human desire for for the heroic does it does it balance it out? But are you especially now as you know you talked about listening to, uh, to Peterson and delving into some of these philosophical um, currents and undercurrents? Are you starting to see uh, shifts in the culture that are philosophically driven and how they may have been showing up in your field? Jennifer, I I don't know that I am seeing trends. I, I tend to see it more as an eternal struggle. Uh, again, reading the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets, I, and when we talk about a prophecy, I think, I think Rand was issuing a warning um, saying, I have seen it. How can you argue with me that, th that this is, whether or not this is true, here it is in the Soviet Union. This is what happens. This is, there are themes of that in our, in our modern life that are, that are corrosive to everything important in a human being. I, in my language, to the soul. They are destructive of the soul, the essence of who we truly are. And I believe she was she was pointing it out as as Jeremiah and Isaiah and all the others in the Old Testament were pointing it out four thousand years ago or more, and it's 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 eternally from from with each generation, uh, it's it's a battle. 
And I believe one of the main things that, that she speaks to, and I don't know if she used the term often, is responsibility. That's what Atlas Shrugged most of all said to me. It's why I would say absolutely yes. It's why one of the reasons if you call, I answer, because it's, it says to people, take responsibility for your own life. And that part of our society is what I see under absolute assault. I don't believe it has any chance of succeeding this postmodern thing. Um, I believe I have a massive bias toward screenwriters and directors, even if they even if they do work that's so different from mine, I see them as my, my sisters and brothers. And, and I believe they're all trying to, to make movies that, that have meaning, but what's being made right now is just crap. And everybody knows it's crap. And, um, and the, the Academy itself, by the way, the year that I entered the Academy, uh, I, I got in because of Braveheart. It was, it was sort of a, a given that if you had done work that would be nominated for an Oscar that, that you would have qualified to be in the Academy. And the year I got in, there were less than 10 writers, less than 10 producers who were allowed in. Over the past 18 months or so, there've been 1,800. Oh, and no, no so idea. it's not based on the on the qualifications that we had, and and I appreciate that people are trying to remedy a, a situation of exclusion and and allow people opportunities. Which I am all for opportunity uh, equality, op equality of outcome is is uh, nonsense, and I think destructive. To I I don't think anybody is so weak that they need to be told you are weaker. Now, so you haven't had a chance to get to the starting line fairly, that we have to remedy. Well, I'm, I'm getting off into political points mm -hmm. of view, but the responsibility to me is what is crucial to say, if you personally believe that I am inferior, that I am heinous, that I am whatever, morally deficient, fine, believe it. But I don't have to internalize your low opinion of me. In fact, your low opinion of me, for me, will drive me harder. So have at it, think what you will. And it's, uh, I told Jordan, and I, I repeat it to you, I, I said to my mother once that I was about to do a, a screening of a movie and I, I told her I was nervous and she said, why are you nervous? And I said, well, there are people who just have their knives out that, that want to be critical. And my mother said, well, son, if they crucified Jesus Christ, they're going to be people who don't like you. And <laughs> I think it's, it was just part of my mother's brilliance is uh, if, if people, if, if everyone has a sort of pleasant opinion about you, what, what does that say about you? Not anything positive. So I, I just, I'm about take responsibility for your own, for your own actions. And I, that I just saw that again and again in Atlas Shrugged. Well, I know we have a lot of Atlas Shrugged fans uh, that, are, that are watching us that have signed up for uh, this webinar on Zoom um, and are watching us on Facebook and the other social media platforms. I want to remind all of you guys, uh, take advantage of this opportunity, submit your questions uh, and, and join me also in just saying thank you to, to Randy, um, who's, who's been very generous to, to the Atlas Society in, in more ways than one. I know that he says he got a great deal out of um, the time that he spent with our students at the Atlas Advocates Retreat, but I am still kicking myself that we didn't film that, or, or uh, I, I took plenty of notes, but that really was a very special afternoon uh, that we spent. And 
we have spent other uh, time together, including one uh, about five years ago when I was recruited to the Atlas Society to, to become its CEO. And, um, and I wanted to talk to you about what I saw was, again, a, a bit of a, a paradox. I you know, knew you, I knew how uh, important, what a central role your, your religious faith had played in your life. I mean, you can see it in your novels, you can see it you know, in your uh, nonfiction, in your screenplays. Um, and yet here was somebody who was just enraptured with Atlas Shrugged, with Ayn Rand, and, um, and I was seeing this as well. I was um, seeing other people, you know, Andy Puzder, uh, who was the CEO of CKE Restaurants, who had um, had all of his six children, a very devout Catholic, uh, had to read the Fountainhead before he would allow them to get their driver's permit. So you know, I began to ask, is this just on, on my end that, um, that I'm seeing this kind of uh, paradox, you know, Ayn Rand, of course, was, was an atheist for the philosophy that she later developed, emphasized reason over faith and a, and a natural knowable um, reality over a supernatural realm. So, um, and yet when we talked, I think it was at Christie's, if I can, can remember back that, that far, um, you had said that what, you took away from uh, Atlas Shrug really had, you know, if anything kind of reinforced these, these values that you found so consonant in your, um, in, in your faith. And of course, you know, the end of that story was that was the article that I, I then uh, developed into my Wall Street Journal article, Can You Love God and Ayn Rand, which I got a lot of pushback for, but if you would share your perspective on, you know, maybe it's not uh, a paradox or a, a contrast at all. I believe that our understanding, our, our assumption, if you will, that uh, faith and atheism are polar opposites is, is superficial. Um, kind of like ice and steam. Um, yeah, they are really different. One makes you cold, one can scald you. But to me, they are very close to each other. Uh, now, very close is an interesting, interesting term. Um, I think of that the people that I know who say they are atheists are oftentimes more likable and more open than people who are doctrinaire about any given philosophy, or any, any understanding. To me, religion is not understanding the deepest mysteries of life. It is it is understanding that you don't understand the deepest mysteries of life. Where I believe that atheism um, most likely is, is missing the point is in asserting that there are no deeper mysteries of life. And not every atheist I know asserts that. So, so there is a way in which I think they're close. Like I'm Christian, I'm, I'm Protestant, in fact. I see Judaism as not just my distant cousins, I see them as brothers and sisters. I also see atheists as my brothers and sisters because I believe that in asserting that they're atheists, they likely, are still struggling with the question. Now, if they've given up struggling, I think they are, they are just as uh, impoverished as the Christian who says, I understand I've given up struggling. In fact, in Jordan Peterson's, one of his lectures, I believe it's Jordan, he said that the name Israel means one who struggles with God. 
So to be of the children of Israel means to, to keep struggling. Now, Jesus had a parable of a father tells his two sons, go work in my field. And one said, I will, and he didn't. And one said, I won't, and he did. Which one did his father's will? So to me, a person, I don't think God, and God to me is the great mystery, but as a Christian, I believe God manifested himself in Jesus Christ. He made himself knowable. He made himself tangible. Now, I believe that, but I think someone who says, I don't believe that is being honest. And that honesty is part of saying to, to the great mystery, I will, instead of, or it, it is doing God's will, even if you say, I don't believe in God. I don't think God cares what label we give ourselves. And I believe that that's what Jesus taught. They do these things. I, people will know you are truly my followers if you love one another. I can't imagine a, a truer statement or a more powerful statement than that. So it wasn't about get your words right, get your dogma right, get your understanding right. So having said that, I believe that Rand, if, if I were to have that opportunity to sit down and talk with her, uh, it, it's interesting, Jennifer, if, um, the, it, what, where, do I, where do atheists imagine when you say someone I'd like to meet in heaven? Uh, if it's like, okay, if atheists don't have that, do they get that, do they get that Hope. You might take a more sci-fi approach. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, so, uh, but I would love to- On the deck of talk. the Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I believe I'll get the chance to sit down with her. And uh, maybe she'll visit me in hell or I'll visit her someplace else, I don't know. But I would love to, to ask her how, how certain she felt of saying there's nothing, there is nothing else. I get the idea of let's not wait for the other world. But I also believe that when, when like I have three sons, uh, when I hug my sons, when I see them, when I, I look at them, there is, there is something to me in love that's so far beyond anything that I, could have articulated or could have understood or ever will understood, understand that it, it intuits to me an eternity. And um, uh, again, I think if, if Rand or my atheist brothers and sisters can't say that with me, um, it doesn't make me love them less. And it doesn't make me think they're more wrong than me. It, it does make me think that I experienced something um, I wish they could experience too, but it may be that they do. Um, I don't judge it because they don't say the same words that I say. All right, well, we could go on about that one for the rest of the time, in which case I would never get to any of the audience questions, in which case I would be doing false advertising and you're not gonna do that. So I, we did have a question here uh, and it's going back to, to your work. Dustin Stewart asks, what can we learn from Braveheart's outsider characteristics? I hadn't thought of it this way. Uh, in other words, what did Wallace learn abroad in his younger years that helped him succeed back in his homeland? This is a fabulous question. I've never right. been asked that before. Now, I'm not sure if, if the, the reference to abroad in his younger years means when I depict in the story that his uncle comes and takes him away. I imagine that's what he means. But there, there are also parts of the William Wallace legend that he went to France, but after, um, after losing uh, 
the, the second large battle, uh, he went to France and tried to recruit the French king to help in the Scottish revolt. And they even say he went to the Vatican, which I think is possible that he did. But I believe the question is referring to what, he, what did he learn in his childhood in that, in that time away. And what, I think this is a vital question because it's about discipline. His, his uncle who takes him away, who comes to, to basically rescue him when he has become orphaned. His uncle says, oh, you don't understand Latin. Well, that's something we'll have to remedy. And then one of my favorite lines, um, my sister actually filled my heart with joy when she pointed this out. She said, boy, I could hear your voice in this line was when, when the uncle and the boy are looking at a funeral and they're playing the bagpipes and the boy says, what are they doing? And, and the uncle says, they're playing, they're saying goodbye. They're playing outlawed tunes on outlawed pipes. It was the same with me and your father when our father was killed and the boy looks at the sword and the uncle watches him lift the sword and then, and he lets him hold it for a moment, but then he takes it from him and says, first learn to use this and then I'll teach you to use this. And that's what he was doing. He was disciplining himself. He was, he was being willing to take the challenge to learn and suffer the pain of learning because the pain of not learning was even greater. And that's something I think we have really lost in, in our modern world, but that the world is crying out for. Young men and young women want a structure, they want a discipline, they want a goal that's better. And I know the danger of that is that it can sound like fascism, but you have to face dangers. The, the danger of doing nothing or the danger of going wrong, well, you have to be willing to, to uh, face that struggle. And that's what William Wallace faced, I believe, in those, on those years abroad. We have a question from Scott uh, on YouTube. He says, what does um, Mr. Wallace think about Zack Snyder saying the political environment today precludes him from remaking uh, The Fountainhead? Wow. I don't know Zack Snyder, but my first editor worked with him, went on to work with, with Zach and says the most wonderful things about him. Um, and everything I've, everything I've seen and heard about him makes me think I would love him and love to meet him. Um, kindred spirits, I hope. Uh, the, I think that, well, I would certainly disagree. Uh, I, I want to, I, he may be, he may be speaking and I, I can't, I can't answer for Zach, but he may be talking about the corporate co cowardice that exists in our world. Um, it was a, a terrific book. I bet you've read it. Uh, Nicholas Taleb wrote a book called Skin in the Game and he wrote Black Swan. He's a brilliant guy. And um, yes. And one of the things he says is an intolerant minority will, will rule over a tolerant majority. And um, I believe that, that that is part of the crisis in the film business is that the, the huge corporations that, that are gobbling up movie production are saying, we can't bear if one person shouts that we are being out of line with the culture. But art is defying, is always defying the culture. So no art is being made. And the fountainhead is about creating art in your life and work. So it will take some outsiders 
back to the original question, it will take outsiders to do that. But outside is kind of where we live. Even if, even if you live on the inside, even if you're, you're Michelangelo or Leonardo and you're, you're seen as a, as a great and accepted artist of your day, you're, where you're really creating is on the outside of the envelope. So speaking of uh, Michelangelo and Leonardo, I want to, uh, to get back to your current projects. Um, when you and I talked before the lockdowns, you were working on a, a really interesting, almost kind of personal project of a one man show with music and, and um, song and uh, acting and uh, and I understand also that you are now moving ahead pretty um, aggressively with another project that grew out of the first sabbatical that you took in your professional life to uh, to Italy. So I'd love to hear a little bit of whatever you can share with us um, on what you're working on now. Well, the um, the second one first. It's called the Swiss Guard and. Um, my sons and I went to Italy together and we were there for an extended period of time. And uh, the, I just, I absolutely adore Italy. It's the, just the most magical place. And um, we were, we have friends who are um, uh, deeply Italian in every way there is to be. And they had they had led us through the Vatican and into uh, meeting some of the Swiss guards, and my sons and I were sitting in a uh, one of the piazzas and and staring at this glorious fountain and and I said, wouldn't it be fascinating if the Pope could sneak out through some of those secret tunnels we know exist in the Vatican and maybe step out of one of the fountains and join the crowd and just walk around with the normal people. And another son said, yeah, and kick ass. And the other son said, so the Pope's Batman. And all of a sudden I went, stop. That's the greatest idea. We've got to do that. And uh, suddenly we were off and running with a, with a new idea. And, and we have a wonderful team of investors who believe in it as well. And we're going to do the movie independently. And that's super exciting. The, the, the principle of that is that the world sees so much that's wrong with the Catholic Church. And there is a stupendous amount that's wrong with every human institution. And particularly, they stand out when it's an institution that purports to care for the poor and and, uh, and, and hold up integrity, then, then its, its shortcomings are gonna be obvious. But to attack the beauty of the church instead of its ugliness is a mistake. So what if you had a man who became the Pope who was determined that at the sacrifice of his own life, he was gonna attack the ugliness and rooted out of the church, no matter what it cost him. And he summons a young lady to the Vatican. And um, she believes she's been brought there to become the first female Swiss guard. And that night the Vatican is attacked and the story becomes like die hard in the Vatican. Um, it's a really exciting story. And, and it also challenges me to explore those issues of what does faith matter? What does it really mean? Um, almost like a Kierkegaard. I named my youngest son after Kierkegaard and Kierkegaard's whole existential idea of what we really know you believe is what we see you do, which I would say brings us back to, to Rand. The, the one man show that I was writing and, and have now written and have performed once already, but COVID's been a, a real problem is that I want, to, I want to explore and to show to young people that you don't have to be limited 
as one art form. I, I wrote songs, I did a lot of physical things, I still do, I still write songs. I, I write movies, I direct movies. I wanted to find a way to combine all of that. And in the, when I was in school, I wanted to be a Renaissance man. And we are in a day of specialization. And I think that beggars us. I think it is a, more than ever, we have a fabulous opportunity to explore a lot of different things and to learn to be good at them. I mean, even what we're doing right now of being able to communicate you and I in different places and with, with people anywhere in the world. Across the world, yeah. Staggering. And we can find great teachers, the best teachers. Um, we, we still miss that human contact. And I believe we're gonna be rediscovering that soon. I, in, with the end of COVID, I think we're gonna celebrate each other. That's what I hope we'll, we'll be doing. I'm dedicated to that. And that's part of why I wanted to write a live show. I wanted to be live with human beings. Well, hopefully it'll be coming to the, the Malibu Playhouse or who knows, maybe even the Atlas Society Gala. On <laughs> the course in that Malibu. would be incredible. That would be incredible. Be a lot of fun. Well, yeah, what you're talking about specialization, I, I, I think is interesting as well. Um, but, you know, you have been an inter, in, a con, individual contributor, you know, writing a novel in a room, writing a screenplay in a room, but you've also been a director and a producer. And I think that defying the specialization and uh, if you are going to be a conductor, you know, it's one thing to be a composer, but if you're gonna be a conductor, it really does help a lot to know a bit about how each instrument, you know, sounds, how it's played. If you're gonna be a manager, if you're going to be a CEO, to have experience doing a lot of different things can help you be a better leader and help you be a better mentor and help you be a better teacher. Well, that's a fabulous point. It's absolutely true. We, we take, there's a, there's a pressure to, to make a child specialize. Say, okay, they're really good at soccer at six years old. They have to just play soccer. Absolute nonsense. Um, but that goes across the board. If, if, Whenever I give younger people advice, I tell them, study a lot of different things. Um, and there are a lot of people who go to film school, but I like to tell them, you want to be a movie maker, uh, especially a narrative filmmaker, but probably any other kind of filmmaker, I mean, documentaries possibly, that it's great that you learn everything, economics, um, business, business, art, um, learn to draw, learn music. Even if you don't feel you have a particular talent at, about it, for one thing, you may have more talent than you think, but it, it is exactly what you say. You need to understand what another person's challenges are. But before I started directing, I studied acting just so that I would, and I have no ambitions for it, but so that I would understand what the actors were experiencing or at least some of what they were experiencing. It's a great thing to do. Well, as usual, see, I was sitting here thinking we had another 15 minutes. We have uh, one minute, so that's it. <laughs> Boom. Um, time just flies every time uh, we get together, Randy. So I'm really grateful that, uh, that you joined us today and grateful to see you again. Hope to see you in person soon. And, um, and thank you for joining us and thank you for all of the help that you've given the Owl Society and thank you for your tremendous contributions. Thank you, darling. And thank you for everybody that's, that's interested in all this and, um, and, and best of luck and drive on. This is a great thing to be doing. We, we will. And thanks to everyone who joined us for taking this hour out of your day. Uh, thanks especially to, to those who are our supporters, who are enjoying not just this weekly webinar series, but all of the work of the Atlas Society, bringing in great minds like Randy Wallace to interact with young people, engage young people with the next 
uh, with the ideas of Ayn Rand. And if you are enjoying that work, if you do want to support it and see that it continues, please consider making a tax deductible donation to the Atlas Society. Thank you all very much and we'll see you next week.